care about this roundabout little rock? About the great above or the great below? They took what was mine, and I will have it back. I am the queen of blood and life, and none shall deny me. You were bound before. Sure, but how do you think you'll manage this time? Only two gates to go, and not only are you fresh out of Wardenburg hearts, you're dead, honey. Are you forgetting who I'm speaking for? She's waiting for you, in every shadow, in every lost moment. She will strike you dead and hang your corpse on a hook. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, sorry to interrupt what is clearly a very productive family therapy session, but I'm thinking our day would be a hell of a lot less stressful if you didn't let her trick you into letting her loose. I guess we'll have to take this up later, mommy dearest. Welcome to another virtual event in the year 20. <laughs> but I just wanted to say though, that I'm so excited to look at all of you in your little Zoom squares. And Nanny and Natasha and Sophia, look at this. This is really fun. Um, and my first question is, how are all of you? And do you have any tips for dealing with the debilitating anxiety of 2020? <laughs> I'm assuming we're all in the same headspace. You know, one day it's great. Another day it's a complete disaster. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Sophia, where in the world are you right now? We've missed I'm you. I'm in Toronto. Oh, okay, good. No, I've wait. missed you guys. The timing of coming back to Toronto was perfect. Cause I've been, as you both know, as all know, I've been working out of town doing a lot of theater. So I decided to leave Stratford. Wow. Just, I just left Stratford in the end of October. Wow. And so it was past October, I was like, I don't want to go back. I need some time off. I want to do film and TV. And actually I had a grant to travel. So the plan was in March, I was going to take off. I was going to go to New York. I was going to go to LA. I was going to go to England and see some plays. I wrote this whole essay about why I think an artist is important to just take a break, travel, see the world. Yeah. And then I was like, I would do the ROM, AGO, he plays. Cause then I started working as a sous chef cause I was so like doing theater, but I also love vegan cooking. I'm a vegan. So I was going to do that. And then COVID hit. So I was like, well, I guess it's a station. So I've just been, I've been home. Wow. Yeah. So exciting. <laughs> Are you cooking a lot from home? I'm cooking so much. Like now it's like I, it's kind of like my kitchen has become like Sophia Cafe where I have everything from lasagna and cookies and chili. And I make like stir fries, salads. Now I'm getting really into like organic food and like I'm learning all of my health and how to take care of myself. It's actually kind of perfect, like strangely, COVID has been, I know that for people, it hit at a time where like no one prepared to just told to stay at home. And as it is, when a job stops, it's the hardest thing to deal with. Where you're like, I was just working, not, you know, six days a week. I had, or I had no days off. Now I have all this time off to just sit and wait. But I fortunately was kind of wanting that time. So mm -hmm. I've just been working on like, skills that I think I, I want to work on anyway. But weirdly, this hit in March, I was fine. And then July hit and things got, things have gotten weird. Like it now, I think what people were feeling in March when it first hit first is what I'm feeling now, where I'm like, okay, it's been five months. I'm done with this break. So what's next? Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, I was actually okay. With jobs that I lost too. Like I had, I had bookings for the summer. I had bookings for like September, October. All that stuff's been canceled, and there's no that I'm like playing a recurring role on, and I'm sort of just like waiting to see if them back because they're all American. Mm. Yeah. Where are you guys? Um, 
Well, I mean, I have been up until relatively recently uh, in Toronto as well. And, yeah. but then um, for the last three weeks, I've been in the Maritimes. I entered the bubble, so. Really? Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in Nova Scotia right now. Yeah, I've been sick. <laughs> I have been reevaluating a lot of my life and, and, and really, I think big time, my relationship to the industry and sort of like my, the energy that I put into that and how I choose to put my energy into that. It's definitely thrown a lot of that into question for me. Um, and I think similarly to you, Sophia, there, I mean, I definitely off the top of this had some, I sort of sunk into a very lethargic sort of depressive state about the whole situation but um post that like I I feel that I've re-engaged with a lot of interests outside of work um that have been so beneficial for me and I feel like my nervous system for the first time in like a decade has had a real time to just readjust calm down like I feel healthier than I have in a while and it's really made me realize that I think as creatives and actors in particular, when you start young, there is no stop. There's, it's all built off of momentum and it's just go, 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 go. And it's really hard to actively take yourself out of that and put a pause on it for long periods of time. So we kind of just don't. And then you arrive at a place where you're exhausted or you're creatively tapped out. You know, and I think when, when the lockdown first happened for me, initially I was like, oh, I, I guess this is my time to like be the most like, you know, creatively like ambitious I ever have because I have all this time. But like, I was just done. Like, yeah. I was so dry. Um, and yeah, so I started doing a bunch of things that are creative for me much like cooking and baking and gardening, all this stuff, but not, you know, that I have typically associated with like creativity of my industry and I right. think it's been very healthy for me to like explore my creativity outside of that context and yeah and I think I think the other thing is just like having patience it's like not my my forte is patience so really having to just like pay attention to that and my relationship with time and just being patient with myself and the world right now so yeah it's definitely a learning experience. I think everyone deals with it in a different way. And yeah, it's an, it's an odd shared experience as well, you know, all over the world to different degrees for some people. Um, and I remember someone saying, you know, there's such immense pressure to be creative, whether it's in your industry or elsewhere or learn new skills or bake and, you know, everything you can with uh, what's going on in the world as well. But it's important to remember that we're not, working from home with a lot of time, we're also dealing with the low grade anxiety of living through a pandemic that none of us have seen before. And that takes a lot of energy. And yeah. it, it, we may have a lot of time, but it doesn't feel like it because we're also spending so much energy kind of getting used to it again and figuring out what's next. Um, but I was also wondering, just going back very quickly to theater because we touched upon it since that's something all four of us have been involved with do you I was curious what you thought about what it's going to look like in the future how are we going to go back are we going to see a lot of different kind of ways of bringing it to screen is there going to be a lot more site-specific theater uh are there some opportunities you were excited about are we going to see a complete shift and we're never going to see it the same way again? It's no answers, but curious to see if you had any thoughts about that. I haven't worked in theater since about 2013, but as a patron of theater, which I saw Sophia and uh, last time I saw you perform was in To Kill a Mockingbird at Stratford. Aww. And, and um, as a patron of theater, I really hope that it doesn't disappear. I hope that there's a way that we can do it with distant 
difference between seats and like people wearing masks in the audience if it comes to that. Um, Cause there is something about the magic of theater that's just completely irreplaceable. Um, but I think we are seeing a lot more um, Zoom style shows and live streams, which are not the same. I, I recently watched a, a a Shakespeare one, a performance of Romeo and Juliet, uh, just from the Georgian Bay Theater. And it was, it was really interesting to, to see it. I mean, yeah, it's certainly not the same, but, um, but it, it was still nice to be able to support. Absolutely. And see how, you know, it also engenders new types of creativity. Some of the Zoom plays I found interesting is when they really use the platform. So they're kind of leaning into the creative itself has technical difficulties that are replicated in how they're talking, but that's only a specific you know, subset of it. So it's not going to work for everything, nor should it have to. Yeah, I'll be interested, I think, to see, Steph, like, what what new work comes uh, or enters sort of the theatrical community and what we're doing, um, like, moving forward with these new parameters in mind and what's created, like, with that in mind, as opposed to and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but, like, trying to do, you know, Romeo and Juliet or Lear or whatever filmed via zoom it's just it's a completely different thing like and also even especially in like contemporary works like the playwrights didn't write those with that formatting in mind but, you know they wrote it for a stage for a lot so it's it's just a different yeah thing. and there's room for all these different things to happen simultaneously yeah. um, I hope. I'm, I, I'm curious to see actually really how long or what the transition period looks like for audiences in terms of their willingness and interest in actually coming together um, for, for really all live things, music included, but like how long that will take? Because I think especially if you look at it within Canada, the demographic that are sort of the bulk of our theater patrons, it's, it, it might be people who are more concerned, you know, a little bit older, mm -hmm. uh, but it also means a kind of revival, a lot of, outdoor and site-specific things. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of festivals that had little distant pods outside. And I'm like, that's something, you know, we can do if we figure it out. But mm -hmm. then like winter in Canada, all those outdoor things are not gonna look the same um, unless we have little igloo bubbles. But I digress, awesome. You get a snowsuit with the price <laughs> of your ticket. <laughs> I think anything is possible because I know that when we hit like stage two, stage three, I was surprised to see how quickly people were going out to patios, how quickly there were so many lineups. Like I thought the fear of stage, what I was hearing in stage one with like even just like bringing your groceries home, how to sanitize it when you put it in the fridge. There was so much fear. And yet, once they start to loosen that, I couldn't believe how many people were going out or how many people I saw on the street. I think there's also a thirst for just human action. Because I heard somewhere that like one in four people have depression, and now it's like one in three people have anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like mental health, the effects of this has been so bad that I think people are going to be thirsty to see live theater, to just, now there's like drive-in, like I haven't gone to a drive-in theater since I was like 15. And yeah. now that's like becoming a thing because we just want to be able to like sit near one and feel like we're not alone. So I would be surprised if theater, but like you're saying site specific, you know, unfortunately like theater right now and what I was told by my agent, it would cost so much money for smaller theaters. Like, I don't know what Strap is going to do, but I know just like, you know, the first two rows of a theater, you can't have people sitting so close. And then just what happens backstage and how you sell tickets, like all of that stuff is going to cost a lot of money. But I do feel like there will be a lot of people who will come out to it because they're, they're thirsty for it. I know for myself, I... You know, I walked by the Rex like a couple of days ago, you know, downtown Toronto and couldn't believe that they've like warded up the wall saying we'll see you soon. And it's one of those things that I can't wait to see. So I feel like a lot of people will, you know, they will show up. Yeah. 
And I'm wondering if this is going to shift the way that um, technology is incorporated into live theater as well. Like, because now people are learning how to do live streams, um, will this just be the new norm where it actually makes theater even more accessible? Like maybe um, even if we are able to have physical people in the audience, we'll also have more live streams. Like, you know, operas have been doing this for a long time where they live stream in movie theaters, but maybe we'll have more live streams with like captions for people. Um, Even like... I you know, I, I try to go to the symphony sometimes. And, and the last time I was there, I was like, you know, I'm really surprised they haven't started like incorporating technology with like close-ups of the violin player or like, you know, to be able to see the sweat of yeah. a musician or like, and even cause like I have really bad eyesight. So it would be cool to have screens as well. So that if the first few rows are empty, but maybe in, in a way to make additional money would be to have like a, you know, cheaper version that's a, a a live stream that people can access online or something. So I, I think you're right, Sophie. I think like the, the desire to connect with people is there. So it's not going to disappear. It's just going to change and yeah. take some time. They will because the yeah. first, like the, in March, March, April, yeah, I was asked to do some readings and we were just doing play. And I found it really challenging just read a play because there was also so much lag in like someone's response. And so that's why there's theater and there's film and TV, because there's a difference in how, you know, you can connect to the work. So I think that, but in Stratford, we filmed plays before, but it does call for close up. It does call for, you know, not having an audience and being able to like sort of treat it like a film. So if we're going to, you know, going to do that kind of stuff, also have to take into account that you can't just have a camera at the back of the room and yeah. think that yeah. you're going to get the same back. It's not the same. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I agree. Yeah. There's definitely something in just making it a lot more accessible and international. You know, there's some, even theaters in Berlin were putting some of their plays online with surtitles. And that was so exciting because we didn't have access to that without being there, you know, and museums are there. And I think that was part of what was, exciting at the beginning oh some things are changing that we're having access to and now that we're getting used to this new normal it's all right what's new you know what else have we not seen that's uh you know happening Um, and speaking of things that are less about relaxing remember when we shot season two of Carmilla in four days and then three whole movie and remember when we were only supposed to have Sophia for two of those four days <laughs> and for everyone else watching, she was doing a um, uh, conservatory acting program at the same time, and they really didn't want their actors to work at the same time as the program. But all we wanted was four days. Yeah. <laughs> um, Which is, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to talk out of turn, but I think, I think the sentiment from that institution on that particular policy has greatly changed since that time. <laughs> Uh-huh. It's, as a, you know it's not the whole length of the program it's uh yeah it's a big difference but it was a lot of fun and such joy working with all of you and i hope we get to do it sometime soon maybe sooner yeah. than we- yeah i was thinking about how that feels like such a lifetime ago um oh. yeah like 2015 five years ago and just the amount of growth and change that I've gone through I think just by nature of like like I turned 30 this year in quarantine (laughs) and had a meltdown but um I I think like just by nature of like you go through so much personal growth between 25 and 30 but then on top of that like a lot of the growth has just been from the experience of working on Carmilla and being thrust into the public eye and and um, the different communities that I've been able to learn from and interact with uh, because of the little web series that could. So it really feels like a lifetime ago. I mean, if five months of quarantine feels like five years then five actual years feels like yeah. <laughs> 10 years ago, <laughs> like I feel like a completely different person from that time. I rewatched it. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you guys hear me? Oh no, rewatched it. I was watching the first and sex season. Oh, I thought you said the first huh? and season <laughs> yeah I did I rewatched first and second season and I was like I cannot believe how much work went into this show and like how solid the show is 
Like when I see like Perry and my sister, I'm just like, I see Steph's name credits. It's like, this is fucking huge. <laughs> like, this was huge. You know, and sometimes I'm on set, I get so overwhelmed because I get very narcissistic and just thinking about what are my lines? What do I have to say? And I don't realize like I'm part of huge production. Until you start watching, you're like, just do your job. You know what I mean? Like, we just need you to be able to, to help because there's so many people invested in this show. It's so interesting to hear that you feel that way because as someone who's had the utmost pleasure of working beside you, you do not come across as a narcissistic person at all. Oh You're my like God. I was such... a nervous wreck doing that show. Like, yeah, you did so, not show. Like, I, I remember <laughs> talking to my agent being like, they're doing like 35 episodes. 35 episodes and I have two days to learn this is ridiculous and remember I in the first first season that I came on you were like it's like theater you know guys like read your script you're gonna do it like a play but that's how they got lines, you have to kill I was like this is not like theater like <laughs> Yeah. yeah theater without a rehearsal oh my god it's like theater on adderall yes like, yeah i would this is added like this is we not been given three months no. there's no preview like uh, what are you talking about <laughs> attempted to steal several humans faces acted out anxieties related to his appearance tried to open a time portal flirted with an alternative approach to chronology rose from their graves to haunt the living. Enjoyed a pleasant day out while making new friends. And that is all we have for today, apparently. See you again tomorrow, maybe. Now wasn't that an improvement to your usual hysterical nonsense? We're putting people in danger. Hardly. We called an airborne swarm of piranha a 10% chance of precipitation. There's moisture involved. You know, I can see why Karm likes you so much. There's something unspoiled here. That's alluring. For a while, anyway. You, hot chocolate girl. You look familiar. Have I seen you somewhere? I think I'd remember that. It's no, I always just had such anxiety about not, not fucking it up for... The, uh, for all the other actors. And I was like, like, I don't want to be the one who like trips or doesn't hit the mark because there's like so many other people in this room who've just been like holding the yeah. shit. Oh yeah. <laughs> I feel like it just prepares you for anything though. After doing it, it's like everything feels very relaxing. <laughs> when you then step on a set after where you're like, yeah. oh, I'm doing four pages today instead of 40. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So all three of you have played characters that were over 100 years old. And how does that feel? And do you keep some of that from your own classic souls? <laughs> we can start with Natasha. Oh, well, yeah, we've talked about this before, but for some reason, no one who knew me personally was surprised when I got cast as a 300-year-old character. And um, I guess I've always been a spirit who's been hanging around for a while. But this is also, like, it was such a gift to be, to be cast as a vampire because this has also become a weird problem where unlike a lot of actors, I'm, like, waiting to age and I can't wait to age because <laughs> I feel like I, I, I've I always struggled with physically looking a bit younger, but not, but just having like a different kind of weight that comes across, um, perhaps, but um, yeah, I, I think it was also just such a gift to, to get to explore that because you don't get to do that very often, and um, yeah, I think I've really found a a niche with ancient supernatural beings for sure. <laughs> My parents literally used to call me a vampire. It's meant to be. Really? <laughs> yeah, like as a child. So it was not 
No one was surprised. Um, but, but it's also funny because I find in that time, like, you know, I guess, I guess I had, was 24 when I auditioned for Carmilla. And I, I feel like in my early twenties, people thought I was the age I am now. And now that I'm 30, people think I'm 21. And I don't know if it's just because like you were saying, Annie, like for so much of it, when you're trying to be an actor, it's like you're hustling and working so hard all the time. And I was like, not that 20 something who like party didn't gotten into shenanigans. I was like so strict, especially when I did used to work in musical theater, especially it was like, I just worked all the time and I was trying to work all the time. And I was stressed about rent and stressed about student loans and like, you know, working three serving jobs at, which I was still doing during season two, <laughs> um, you know, and like it was, and now I feel like the older I get, the the more youthful I seem perhaps because I'm able to just kind of like, care a little bit less and I feel more grounded in myself and I can like let go of things um yeah and and find room to to play yeah I thought part of the joy of playing such an ancient creature was kind of kind of exactly that it was just like playing a character with such incredible perspective right it's like you've seen everything she she lived through so much and so well, you know. how many pandemics do you think they've all lived through? This is probably like, okay, here we go again. We've done this. <laughs> yeah. we hated it. <laughs> Maybe it's, do you think their fourth or fifth pandemic? Well, well, well Maddie's older than Carmilla, so... Maddie's probably been through a few, a few pandemics. I feel like Carmilla maybe just one or two, because... Uh -huh. She's and the dean, I think, how old? The dean was ancient, so I think she'd been through them all. Even the big like one point. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. She started them. <laughs> she started them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pissed at this guy, you know, in the old Sumerian <laughs> Testament. Yeah. <laughs> it feels almost like, as Maddie, it feels like, very biblical like it feels like there is an acceptance that humanity is here and will live on this planet but the planet will keep going and we tend to do the things we all do such chaos and a desire to control a pandemic or point finger and I think that's the thing about living through so many pandemics and so many wars is that you realize that the world keeps going. So you just kind of like sit back in the acceptance of, I'm going to try to accept the ride that I'm on right now. And that's why Maddie mm -hmm. can like eat chocolate and drink blood and just look at the chaos kind of laugh with a bit what of what humans do. Yeah. You know, like even for myself with COVID, I was doing a thing where I kind of went down a rabbit hole of like looking at conspiracies and like what they were saying about it and who they were pointing fingers at. And then I realized, yeah. oh my God, we've been doing this over and over again. Yeah. History. So you kind of, and then stopped. And I was like, I think I just have to do meditation. <laughs> And just accept. Yeah, it feels like the universe is on a, it's just, it's sort of a, it feels like we're all in a timeout. Yes. Absolutely. I yeah. heard stuff like dolphins are in Venice. Yes. And like, look at, you know, look at how the weather is in China. It's like the, the earth is going to keep doing what it does while we like fight each other. Like, it doesn't matter who you want to blame, you know, civilizations have been before us, yeah. you know, but the world's going to keep turning. And it sounds negative sometimes because I'm just I have moments where I to myself, well, what is the point if I'm just going to die in dust? <laughs> but, you know, but then it's also like, well, you can have a positive impact. You can live your life to the fullest because that's your mental And it could be healthy to take a step back. You know, and uh, absolutely, because we don't get to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and 
following up on that, what do you think a Maddie spinoff would look like? Yeah. If she could travel anywhere. What would a Maddie spinoff be? Spinoff be, yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like it would be, well, especially because I'm in the part, I would want Europe. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Maddie would want to fall in love. Because it is, it's a human thing. Like, it feels like it's unnecessary for her. That's part of being in this body. Like, Maddie is still alive. She's still living life. And she's amongst other humans. Like, she went to Silas and was still okay being around these students. Had no idea. And there's a reason. Because there is something that's very attractive about human emotion. Yeah. There's something that is really appealing about having desire and wanting. So I feel like being able to travel the world but fall in love in an adventurous way. Like it couldn't just be like a guy sweeping off her feet. There yeah. would have to be some challenges, okay? You'd have to look for it. Yeah. Got it. But there would be love in her life. <laughs> And it would be amazing to see someone like Maddie fall for love because it's like it's a secret that you hold so much, but it's still so satisfying to someone who feels like they have it figured out and they can still fall. Yeah. They can still show like some, you know what I mean? They're not as big as they come. And a sense of uh, vulnerability is really fun to explore, especially when they're so at odds with the, the character. <laughs> oh god you went and fell in love with one of the marks again didn't you I oh love no one said anything about you little oh. sap but then again you were always in the middle of some one great romance or another weren't you oh don't need him he's a poet or her she's got such a beautiful voice or that one she's just too pretty to ruin and is there any art, films, shows, books that have inspired you recently that you'd like to talk about? Was it books, stories? Yeah, any, any art or, that has inspired you recently that you've kind of been able to fully take So this is gonna sound so, this, okay, well this is gonna sound so, so strange, but I bought, an, I bought a record player. So I'm like on the unfold school like Miss Simone, oh. Sarah Vaughan, Beatles, Jan Chopin. I want old records. <laughs> I've also been reading the Bible. Oh. It sounds so upset. This is a thing. I went to, like being a serious like I really was like I was diving for dark place like, and spirit theory stuff. Like I was really starting to feel like what is the point? This has happened before. And the more I started reading the Bible and I have actually met a pastor and I've been asking him all the questions about, well, what does this mean? Why are you so obsessed with the Bible? Why, what is, what, what is the story? It is real. And it's fascinating. Because it's a lot of stuff that you mean on everything from like the law of attraction to why I meditate to things you do on Oprah, actually all is from the Bible, like a lot of stories. And like the fact that certain cultures that couldn't read were taught by, you know, by government officials, mm -hmm. they pick apart what they want to educate civilization on. It's really fascinating. So I'm not reading it because, well, I'm Christian or this is my religion. I'm reading it because it's just a fascinating book. Try to like dissect and mm -hmm. be like, well, why? Why are people like this? Mm -hmm. really, like, it's, it's book is one of the, it is the most translated book in the world. And it talks about the human condition, you know, and so much of like spiritual art from this very book so yeah I've been reading that and I'm sure there's a lot that uh, that comes out of it that you hadn't expected to to read that's in there too 
or surprising moments. Absolutely. But it's weird to be like reading the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but also very apropos in this time, you know? So. <laughs> What about you two? I think that's really interesting and also um, strangely synchronistic. I haven't been reading it, reading it, but um, like a few days ago, I was thinking about how I've never actually read it, and I was like, wonder, wonder what's in there. So that's funny that you say that. Um, uh, but as someone who has not read it, true or false? There's nothing really anti-gay in there, is there? True or false? Have you come across anything that says to folks of the same sex should not fall in love upon your readings? No, there's nothing in there that exactly says that explicitly says that that is bad. Mm. Ha! <laughs> there you go. Like that thing that makes it a fascinating book is people take what they want from it and they have broken it down to serve their own purpose. Like, in this past, he's, like, the whole reason the Bible say things, like, it's because of procreation. Well, it's like, this. well, you have two people of the same sex, they can't procreate. So that would be a reason for there being, like, a reason for a man and woman to be together. But we've all advanced much in technology that, like, two people together who can go and have a child. There's nothing wrong with that. Like it's, there's so much more the Bible than like what we've been led to believe. That's the that's devastating. So I've sort of written it off, especially as an artist. That it's just one of those books that it's like, well, I'm an artist. I have, I have friends who are not heterosexual, you know. But I've been now taught that there's so much more to it than than what I've been to believe. And there's a way to reconcile sexuality with your view of scriptures, just like they have been reinterpreted and weaponized in ways that, you know, have been used to bludgeon multiple communities. And it's, you know, yeah. a lot of interpretation. And the fact that it's really, really old, a lot has changed. You know, we eat shellfish. It's not seen as a huge sin or was it something like well, that? Well, that's the thing. Yeah. That is really interesting. Yeah. I think it's even like... Um, I've been reading a little bit more. I've I've been reading tarot cards for like 20 years and I've been reading a little bit more about like different interpretations of them and even something like that. I think anything spiritual, it's like not, it's really about people's interpretations of things and it's like how you interpret it. And I've been doing a lot of readings for people over <laughs> Zoom lately too and yeah. it's, and then different friends. And so it's been really nice to just use it more as like, people see it as like a very occult thing, but I kind of like use it more as a mindfulness practice and using it as is like okay well this is what traditionally this card means but how do I interpret it or what does the imagery say to me or the person I'm reading and that's really neat I've kind of been going in the opposite direction where I've been trying to I mean especially in light of recent events I think like I've been trying to sort of decolonize my bookshelf more in in the sense of just like reading more books that are not by cis straight white men um and and I, I talked about this on my Instagram page recently but I was thinking about how like growing up I was really informed by writers like Bukowski and like Jack Kerouac and like you know uh you know I had that sort of toxic not like other girls syndrome where I was like well I read these cool books written by like cool men and then as like an adult woman you're like they were creepy like misogynist alcoholics and this you know and I was like yeah, I really wasn't introduced to a lot of female writers, let alone BIPOC writers, let alone LGBTQ plus writers. So it was like, I've just been trying to read more. And, and also I've gotten really into um, audiobooks, which I used to see as cheating oh, yeah. in a way. But um, I've learned that as someone with a musical background and a sort of more ADHD type brain, it, it's an easier way for me to absorb information. And I'm, I've really tried to, um, I used to be very resistant to technology and even like digital journaling and things like that. And so I've really gotten more into 
I think technology in general and how it can be used for mindfulness and positivity and learning. So audiobooks have been really great. I have like a gratitude app that's been really cool. And I've been using journaling that every night. Yeah. Cause I'd always try to buy like an old fashioned journal and I'd be like, this is a new crisp journal. I'm so excited. I'm going to like journal every day. And then I just wouldn't use it. So now it's like, I have a mood tracker app. I have a gratitude app, but you know, I'm listening to audiobooks and listening to podcasts and trying to just be less resistant to that and not see it as cheating or less authentic because I think there's this idea that like oh as a writer I must always carry around this massive leather bound book and write with a freaking quill and that's the only way my like art and learning is legitimate (laughs) Um, so yeah I've kind of been shifting in like that that sort of way um oh actually sorry I think I have that same gratitude app or maybe it's just called gratitude uh mine's called grateful um yep it's just definitely that one I love it really I found it really helpful to force yourself to look at the positives of the day and what I am you know just take the the mindful step of looking at it and making it specific and tangible has anyone well no I was just gonna say that I've actually noticed oddly enough and I, I thought I assumed it would have swung in the other direction for me but during all of this um my ability to sort of engage uh, in media, uh, like on screen, it, on a phone, uh, it has really decreased. I, it's, um, yeah, my, my brain has really just, so I've kind of detached quite a bit, I would say more than previously in terms of my, my time spent on screen or on the internet. And yeah, but I don't know, I've been trying to take in some other, like other forms, you know, reading and stuff like that, like book wise. But yeah, I just can't, I can't be on, I can't be on a screen too much these days. No, and it's doom scrolling is real. There's only so much of the news we can take. And yeah. I think similarly with, you know, engaging with uh, what's happening right now and activism too, I've been struggling with what's a sustainable way to keep doing it incrementally in a way that makes sense that you can keep that you can keep it going, you know, because I used to at the beginning of this, especially here in LA, I went like, you know, every couple days to various protests. I was doing a lot of graphic design for a couple different groups. And then it's just, it's unsustainable. And I know it's not realistic. So what are ways that we can, you know, just put aside a little bit of time, stay engaged and keep it as part of your daily diet, so to speak, the same way that dealing with screen fatigue and 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 all that and not feeling guilty. You know, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I feel guilty if I'm not reading enough of news or knowing enough yeah. what's happening. Uh, but it's okay to take that time and it's probably it'll make you a healthier advocate as well if you're able to you know and more effective when you are right like fatigue it just doesn't it doesn't do anyone any good you're not you know exactly um speaking of inspiring things I have been loving Michaela Cole's I May Destroy You you been watching yeah, yeah. oh yeah I haven't seen it yet. Don't tell me anything. I haven't seen it yet, so don't. But it's on my yeah. Top. Well, I want to say it's it's just it's so wonderful and challenging and interesting to watch. It's so different than chewing gum, and I'm just cheering for her success, and I can't wait to see more. Yeah, it's an incredible show, and it's definitely don't binge it. Take your time with it it would be my only advice for anyone who hasn't seen it yet because it is challenging to watch and triggering if you've had similar experiences but um it's really great and without any spoilers I I shared this a while ago on Twitter but I was like I literally like screamed at my screen when I saw period sex on screen Oh shit. And actual (laughs) condom use on screen as well because we always see these like you know, impromptu sex scenes between a cis hetero couple and no one pulls out a condom. Like, it's just like, we just never talk about birth control. And it's not like it was a big part of the scene, but it just like, just even the moment of just like watching someone like throw out a condom, I was like, yeah, we just need to see more of that. Like, let's just put it in people's brains. And then like period sex as well. And it wasn't just one drop. That's all I'll say. It was they really oh, go in. Great. Yeah. It made me so happy. Nice. And also being able to 
kind of toggle between extreme sadness and then laughter, you know, moments you're laughing out loud hysterically because it's so silly and funny. And then it really manages to, you know, move in different worlds and really touch. Yeah. It. Another show I was sleeping on that I started watching in quarantine was pen 15, which is extremely funny. It's um, just a comedy show and it's just so brilliant the way it is uh the two lead actors play 13 year old versions of themselves and you actually forget that they're adult women <laughs> sort of by the end of it because like and all the other actors are 13 um but you know it takes place in like the early 2000s so I think for like anyone between the ages of like 29 and 35 it was just like whoa massive flashbacks of like school dances <laughs> so good <laughs> much you know it's very theatrical too it's just a joy the pure joy pure joy yeah. is great and we definitely need more of that yeah and it still deals with a lot of important issues and bullying and racism and female sexuality and that was really neat too to see a coming of age story that was women about women as well and um because you know we, we get so many super bads and things like that but we we don't see a lot of um stories where it's like you know yeah a teenage girl is starting to go through puberty and like starting to have weird tingly feelings. <laughs> That's a great show. Yeah. You don't know? Well, this world can be a messy place. And if a girl's going to get anywhere, she might have to spill a little blood. Or a lot. Now, we have a problem, you and I. Something isn't quite right. I can feel it, like a storm in the distance coming for us. And you, Miss Prim and Proper, you know something. How could I possibly know anything? You do. Someone killed your little pals at the paper, but not you. No, they send you messages. They send you dreams. Do you want to know what I see in my dreams? I see the great beast dead and the gates opening. I see the reign of hell on earth and the end of all things. The first gate wants strength, wants the rook. What? The first gate wants the rook. Are you playing games with me? Hmm. Do you really think that this is a game? Okay. So, do you remember when we did those periscopes back in season two? Yeah. <laughs> like this or this? You say yes or that, this or that, this or that. So it's basically a round of this or that with, don't worry, very either silly or philosophical questions. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Why don't we jump right into that? Okay. And the first one would be, would you rather have one get out of jail free card or a key that opens any door? Very. It opens any door. Yeah, yeah. Key, key that opens any door. Because then I'd have a key to open my jail cell door. That's true. Um, would you rather play Perry or the Dean? This is for all three of you. I can't answer that. I will not. Okay, we'll pick the other two then. We'll, we'll... <laughs> Annie can't answer that. No, oh, she's not answering me, so it goes straight to you and then Sophia. <sighs> I mean, the Dean. Because yay, vil villains. But also, I know Annie said playing Perry, you know, was sometimes a little stressful because she's quite uh, uptight and neurotic. And so I feel like my butthole couldn't handle all that clenching. Still tired. Butthole's still tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would totally be the D. Yeah, you could see that. Perry right. was exhausting. <laughs> like... <laughs> Would you rather have whatever you are thinking appear above your head for everyone to see or have absolutely everything you do live streamed for everyone to see? Okay. <laughs> All in both situations. <laughs> Look at our faces. Everyone's like, <laughs> <laughs> thoughts are displayed. So if it's the thought thing though, I just go where I go and only people who are in front of me can see my thoughts though, right? Yeah. Or just live streamed all yeah. day my whole life <laughs> yeah i guess bueno. the thing, and then i just didn't have any friends and i live in a hut in the woods by my lonesome with my dirty thoughts 
watch Fun Home. <laughs> the thought thing absolutely because I don't even like to see myself in unflattering lighting so I can't imagine like being live streamed all the time like my vanity is like no also I'm just like disgusting like with as someone with like anxiety IBS like I people don't need to see what happens sometimes okay no one needs to see that uh but also as you know Annie especially knows I have very little filters and I have a very hard time not saying exactly what I'm thinking so I feel like that would be an easy one for me but also really beneficial because people also I have this like um you know sick need to like please everyone and then I get very sad when people believe fallacies about me so I'd be really happy to just like have my thoughts there so when and sometimes I'm not the best communicator either and I I definitely put my foot in my mouth a lot and I or like I speak too quickly and then I don't say what I actually am trying to say so it'd be great if people just knew that I'm always very genuine and trying to do my best that would make me happy yeah we don't need live stream very private person needs no one needs to see me like plucking out nipple hairs uh, maybe they do though. Maybe if shit hits the fan, I'll start an OnlyFans and it'll just be that. But <laughs> maybe there's a market for that. We don't know. <laughs> See, this is why Light Sisters. Because you exactly. and I both. I'm like, I want people to see like glimpse, just see just one thought, but to follow you for the day. I feel like you'd call police. Or you feel like I'm unwell. Like you would just be <laughs> and like, no one needs to do that. <laughs> like, I remember having my pet dog. And he witnessed things that I was like, if you talk, <laughs> like, it would be so bad. Because <laughs> you've seen things so much in me. <laughs> so, yeah, I just need to see a clip of my life. Please don't. Please don't. I would kill myself if you saw that. No. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good question. I'd probably do the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can you imagine people watching you all the time? No. And, no one God. Needs- and you didn't know they were watching? No. <laughs> That's the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Okay. laughs> God. <laughs> I'm the person that, like, you know when you see someone, like, smelling their fingers? It would be a lot of that kind of stuff. Where, like, <laughs> this sheet wave. Well, I was just like. <laughs> and the good thing is we'd also have a backstory as to why you're smelling your fingers. You'd see that. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know <what> the fingers <laughs> Unclenching your butthole from playing Perry. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. A lot of butt questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you rather be able to see 10 minutes into your own future or 10 minutes into the future of anyone but yourself? Like at any given time of our choosing? Mm-hmm. Like I want to see 10 minutes when I'm 40? No, like in present day. For instance, you can either see 10 minutes into Annie's future or like 10 right minutes. Into Natasha and Sophia's future. I'd take someone else. <laughs> like if it's immediate. I know what I'm doing with my next. I'm in control of my next 10 minutes. I pretty much have that mapped out. What's happening in the next 10 minutes? I'd spy, I'd spy yeah. on Sophia for the next 10 minutes is what I'd do. <laughs> I do. You, you get the. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, someone else for sure. Because also, do we have the control, like the ability to change our future? I would say no. Let's no. See. Well, then it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't want to see it then. If I have the possibility to change my future, then great. But. Right, 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 right. But 10 minutes is 10 minutes. I think I want to see my own future. Say that again. 10 minutes, yes, but I'd want to, I'd see my own future. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's, cause it's like watch yourself. I, I don't like watching myself on camera. I don't like watching myself on camera. But every once in a while, if I've seen something that I've done, whether it's like a tape or something, like, oh my God, is that what I look like? Oh 
oh shit, is that what I do? Oh, <laughs> so forget to like watch myself in a minute. It's like, oh my God. It's so narcissistic, but I, I, I would do it. I would do my If you could see into someone else's like future, even just 10 minutes though, you know, it'd be great. It'd be impossible for anyone to like betray you because they'd be like, oh, I'm just going to the grocery store. And then you'd see them turn the other yeah, way. Like, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Wait. But it would also be impossible to ever have anyone throw a surprise party for you. you liar. <laughs> Excellent. That would suit me fine. Yeah. <laughs> is it just me or like i definitely put on deodorant like before a zoom as if people could smell me but then you realize you're just behind the screen i've done that oh yeah oh yeah all the time i brush my teeth too (laughs) as if you can smell my (laughs) i'm disgusting i never wear deodorant anyway so (laughs) maybe you just smell great without deodorant or not, which is fine too. <laughs> and another thing I've been thinking about a lot is that, um, I think, I forget where I saw it that was put so succinctly, the whole kind of group of people that you had just kind of casual conversations with, whether it's at cafes or work or this friend that you don't know that well that you'd like to see more or work people, like all those relationships have just disappeared because they're not people that you were close enough to have a Zoom with um, and you're not necessarily going to organize a distant hang with them. So it's like that whole kind of class of relationships is just gone. Well, the, like that is community, right? Like mm-hmm. there's the inner circle, yeah, that are the close people we can text or we can call, but like our communities at large, which, you know, vastly impact the health of any given individual, that's gone. And I think that's, you yeah. Know, just talking to your barista. Yeah, 100%. Just seeing the same people. I don't really think about how, how important and kind of enriching that was. I'm just thinking of a new neighbor moved in next door and I was like, hello, <laughs> you know, let's sit on our stoop and chat. And it was so exciting. And it's such a small thing that suddenly fills you with such, uh, such joy, just like parks. I live in parks now. It's all I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New people there. I've been walking so much. Mm. Like, I, and I'm all in here now. Mm. I call this 87 year old man. His name is Roly. He's blind. I call him just to check up, see how he's doing. Because I, I started hearing all this about people in COVID, especially the elderly, who aren't leaving homes because mm-hmm. they were afraid or they didn't have access, they didn't have a car, and so, or they didn't PPE. So, they needed volunteers, so I just start calling him. And now I'm gonna I'm volunteering for the place, but I'm waiting right now because they've gotta look at my uh, police record before they'll let me work in the building. I have to do the police record. Oh man. But I'm gonna teach improv classes. Wow. And like, that's do, incredible. Like, some stuff like uh, individuals who have disabilities, low functioning. That's yeah, incredible. Oh, what a nice like, thing. You know, they need volunteers. I do feel like lack of connection with people. And I, like, yeah. my partner, I live with partner. And I can't imagine, like, being by myself or just not being able to see my friends. And, like, or just, you know, being a person of that age before they're saying COVID could affect you. So you need, you know, to be in isolation. Yeah. It's, it's hard. My grandmother's hearing is quite bad, so, and I, I've, you know, I try to call her, but she, she has a difficult time hearing me, so what I've been doing is sending her Instax photos, like Polaroids, in the old-fashioned snail mail, because oh, she doesn't even have a voice way. machine, and, like, there's no way I can, like, even, you oh know, FaceTime God. her or anything, <laughs> so I've been sending her old... Tangible. That yeah. is the best. Yeah. With like very large all caps writing in cards, so she can read it too. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. The amount of things I don't. How have you gotten ordering a lot of stuff online? Because I've stuff mailed to me. It is the best feeling when the package arrives. Like yes, it has a name on it. It's mine. <laughs> yeah, snail mail. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love it. <laughs> I love mail. Love receiving mail. Love sending it. Definitely. Come on. Yes. Learn to mail in this time period. And it's like, I can't believe I'm going to get a letter. Yeah, you're like, 
Nobody knows my name. <laughs> yeah, you know, still going. Yeah, that's another. <laughs> oh yeah, did you have any? What else is going? What's going on? I miss you guys. Sorry, I'm really out of eloquent ways to say I it. I miss you. I miss you guys. I wish oh, we could. It's really nice <sighs> to see all your faces. Yeah. Miss hugs a lot. Yeah. I don't. Touchy <laughs> feely. For those of us that live for the She's such a vampire. Nona vibes. <laughs> no, do you know what? Hugging myself, just <laughs> classic Taurus. Yeah, just like needs the physical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like no no I, I mean I know I do miss hugs with certain people absolutely but I'm me, me. <laughs> yes you <laughs> but I and I know I do miss hugs with certain people and like it was very strange to you know I had a park hanging with a friend yesterday and it was very strange to not be able to hug them when they were sharing you know things with me and I just like wanted to hug them so bad but in terms of like folks who and this is odd because like look I'm half Greek and like they just they like kiss your face when they first meet someone so yeah like but I was not down with that and I'm I'm really okay with like hugs for new people not being a thing like you know there are folks who just replace the handshake with the hug and I don't really like that like if I don't know someone I'm just sort of like oh gosh and people think I'm a jerk but it's just I don't know I can't no it's you know it's yeah I miss hugs with certain people though. Like it's, it's definitely, um, yeah, it'll be nice to be able to return to that at some point. It's weird when you're like in the moment when you feel like you're talking to someone and cause some of my friends, they're trying to follow the call. So there's feeling of like, I think you want to hug you, but I don't think we should hug. So is there's that with like, okay, bye. You know, when you feel like, uh, should I hug you? Should I offer a hug? Oh, I don't know how comfortable you are with this. Okay, I'll just, you know, I'll just do this. <laughs> you know, there's a of that. Like the notion of consent, like yeah. in this age, or this time, Yeah, you're, you're like, is it okay? You know? It's like the next level of it, right? But like I, I, I work with a friend. I know. We're all comfortable saying it, which is nice, you know? Yeah. Especially with the younger kids. I have two, yeah. like, two-year-old cousins here that I went to see, and I'm so used to, like, scooping them up and, like, kissing her face. And last time I went to see them, she, she ran towards me, and, I, and then I had to be like, no, you can't. And she so, she, like, just did not. Oh, wow. She, like, stopped. She fell to the ground looked for a beat oh, and then no. bawled and then and then her dad was like it's okay you just wanted to get oh up. no really so oh then no hugs from afar like, that. now give me a kiss now give me another kiss and that was great so she just wanted it was just the, yeah. you know understanding oh all of my all of our social norms have changed like how do i as a two-year-old deal with this um, that's the other strange thing is like going to go out in the world and being families where their kids and the rollers, they recognize what a face mask is. Like they're putting on a little mask and it's like, I never had, I was exposed to that. I have no idea what it feels like to be a child now where you're like, you can't leave your house without a mask. Yeah. You know, and you have a sanitizer on. It's like, what does that, you know? How does that translate for a child? Recently about, you know, the effects of childhood development and the fact that, you know, children, young children learn to, to read emotions and get their cues very much in a visual way. And specifically how yeah. that's teaching. I mean, you know, and in young children's lives, like the month, the year that we've already spent close to it, you know, in this circumstance is profound yeah. profound effects on sort of their ability to you know interpret right it's, it's a whole it's just it's a very different there's a lot of new information and it's just a it's a new world really so there's yeah. so much i don't know how much options you guys been on 
But one thing that I loved is like the amount of tapes. I just do self tape. I don't have to go in for audition. Yeah. I do have some coming up, so I had a COVID test, but everything's at my house. And I have virtual audition as well. Now it's just virtual audition. Normal. Okay, but here's the thing. I don't like the virtual auditions because I've been in a few and they don't turn on their camera. And so I'm here, like, really? welcome to my boudoir, like, strangers on the internet. Like, not fair. Don't like it. Don't like talking. Oh, you can't read on the face on the camera on. Don't like it. Self-tapes? Yeah. All about the self-tapes. Yes. Fine, fine, fine. But, oof. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the virtual audition either. Um... Except for with voice over auditions, because it is nice to receive direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it also, it doesn't, it's not about what you look like or what your, your home looks like. So that was okay. Um, but yeah, it is, it is really odd to do that. I think what this time has also made me realize um, is that I would like to be stepping behind the camera a little bit more um, and, and things that I've missed um, more than acting and, and things just that I, you know, I've been doing a lot of introspective work as well. And, um, yeah, it's been really neat to kind of just think about how I want to shift or how I want to move forward with the way I tell stories and, and to learn some new skills and whatnot, or, or to discover that, like I've been, you know, producing little live reads of pilots with different actors and facilitating like different book clubs and women's groups and things like that over Zoom and, and realizing and recognizing that that's, you know, a skill I have, I think is bringing people together or um, helping other people tell their stories. And, and I don't know. Um, yeah, I think uh, in the past couple of years, my own personal star has sort of been in retrograde. That's what I've been saying. So I, I, I honestly was not working very much um, prior to all this. So I was pretty prepared for it because it's not like I had a bunch of things that were suddenly taken away. I mean, there was the odd like convention or travel things um, and like, you know, the odd audition put on hold. But I, yeah, I think I have was sort of prepared for this and it just gave me an opportunity to reflect more on what kind of how I want to like continue my education and how I want to um, move forward as a creative not to say that I don't want to act anymore but also just realizing that I think I thrive better in spaces where um yeah I have more control and, yep. you things. and produce and then you have those events that happened you know and it's, it's something so tangible and something done which is yeah I wanted to do more fiction podcasts recently because some of the kind of tv projects are just especially now even slower than usual um so it'd be really nice to just you know have the satisfaction of something finished and going through the motions of putting it together is really satisfying well how long have we been on here for an hour and a half like an hour and 20 holy cow it's like on it's full of this time, what is time? We don't know what time is. We could play. Yeah, stuff. I'm just like, wow, it's so <laughs> nice to see all faces. Just a few vampiric <laughs> gals. <laughs> we got three old souls, all played over a hundred years old. It's so nice. And I miss you all dearly. And I love it. It's always open. You can call me and text and chat yeah. whenever. Be nice. And Wow, sorry, pandemic brain just fully took over. I'm like, hmm, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but again, to reiterate, I'm just so glad I got a chance to chat with you guys again. And I'm sure it will be really fun to rewatch on the other side as well. So thank you so much for taking part in this. And big ups to both TQ and Amber for bringing us together. It was really lovely. And hopefully <laughs> Thanks for hosting this. Thank it was you. so nice to see yeah, everyone's awesome. faces again. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great to be a part of it. And it was so lovely to see the three of you as well. Yeah. Oh, I miss you. Mm. Take care of yourselves. Yes, be good and kind to yourselves. Yeah. And around you and just be gentle mm -hmm. with yourself in the world and right now. Hello to everyone watching. That also goes. I'm crying. Let's all be kind. Okay. To ourselves and to each other.
And to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. 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 Hey, Maddie. <laughs> hey, sis. <laughs> Why are you? Back from the underworld and lounging in your charmingly bohemian pied a terre. <laughs> For starters. You and I and the little ingenue that could are going on a road trip. Turns out the anglerfish was female. Before it died, it laid eggs. <sighs> Just an alarming number of eggs. All right, let's get going.